Right, everyone. My name is Kathy Smith. I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the library system. Every good student should learn how to use the library. If you have to do a research project, the library is the place to go to for information. Libraries contain books and periodicals, magazines and newspapers on many different subjects. To find the information you need, you must know how to use the library. All libraries are organised in much the same way. Every library houses a collection of books. Many libraries also have periodicals, films, and records. All the books in a library can be classified under two main categories: fiction and non-fiction. Books of fiction contain stories that were made up by the author. Books of non-fiction contain factual material. When doing research, you use non-fiction books because you are looking for factual information. All the fictional books in a library are grouped in one section. They are arranged alphabetically by the last name of the author. Many libraries also label the spines of all books of fiction with the letters F I C or F. All libraries have a system for organizing and classifying non-fiction books. The most widely used system is the Dewey Decimal System. It was designed by an American librarian named Melvin Dewey. It is called the Decimal System because it divides all non-fiction books into ten major categories. These are further divided into subdivisions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. For example, all science books are numbered from 500 through 599. Each different field of science has a number within the 500 category. For example, astronomy is 520, and chemistry is 540. The Dewey Decimal System provides a category for every type of non-fiction book. The best way to locate a book in the library is to use the card catalogue. The card catalogue is an index of all the books in the library. Information about a book is listed on cards. All the cards are filed alphabetically and stored in drawers in large cabinets. The card catalogue can help you locate a particular book, a book on a certain subject, or a book by a particular author. In the card catalog, each book has three cards: an author card, a title card, and a subject card. The author card is alphabetized under the author's name. The title card is filed alphabetically according to the title of the book. The subject card is filed alphabetically under the name of the subject of the book. In many university libraries, they use their own bibliotis cataloging system or the microfiche system. Both of them list publications under author and title, and both are very easy to use. Now let us see the reference books. We all know that reference books make up important part of a library's non-fiction books collection. They contain facts and information about any subject you can think of. Reference books are not meant to be read from cover to cover. You should use them when you want important facts and information about a particular subject. Let's see some major types of reference books. First, dictionaries. Dictionaries are books that list and give the meanings of the words in a language. They also give the pronunciation of words in a dictionary, which are listed alphabetically. Second is encyclopedias. Encyclopedias are reference books that provide factual information about people, events, places, and subjects of lasting interest. Each article is written by a specialist on the topic being discussed. An encyclopedia usually consists of a number of books 
arranged in a set. The volumes are arranged in alphabetical order according to the topic of each article. Letters are stamped on the spine of each volume to indicate the alphabetical rang of the topics in each volume. For instance, if you wanted to find information about the moon, you would look in volume eight of the encyclopedia pictured here. Next is atlases. An atlas is a book of maps. It may contain many different kinds of maps. The maps in an atlas are often arranged alphabetically by country or continent. Almanacs are also a type of reference books. An almanac is a book that contains recent statistics and summaries of information on a wide variety of topics. It is published annually. Information is listed alphabetically by subject. Indexes are alphabetical lists of names, titles, and subjects that tell where information about each can be found in other publications. For example, the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature can help you find magazine articles that have been published about a particular subject. It will give you the names of publications that have carried articles about the subject, the dates and volume numbers of the particular issue in which the articles appeared. You should be aware that reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances; they are used only in the library. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the Scottish Highlands. First, you have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to eighteen. Today I have with me Moira Mackenzie, the author of several books in a well-known series of travel guides, and she'll be talking about what is probably the most fascinating wildlife area in Europe, the Scottish Highlands. Moira. Yes, that's right, and it's a wonderful place to visit with lots to do in an area that makes up over half of Scotland, including the seven hundred and ninety islands that lie scattered around the coast. It covers thirty-nine thousand square kilometers. Getting there is easy. From here in Glasgow, a good starting point is Fort William on the west coast, with regular bus and rail services linking the two. I'd recommend the train, which takes four hours to get there. Alternatively, you can take the Highland Line, which takes the more easterly route up to Inverness. That, in fact, is a bit quicker, taking around three and a half hours to cover the two hundred and eighty kilometers from here. There are also two main options by road. You can take either the A9 up through Stirling and Perth, and then on to Inverness, or else on the west there's the A82, which runs up to Fort William, and then, if you want, on to Inverness. Now, a lot of people associate the Highlands with bitterly cold weather, but in fact, the region has a generally mild climate, as a result of being surrounded on three sides by sea, particularly the warm waters of the Atlantic. At sea level in the west, for instance, the temperature ranges on average from a minimum of one degree centigrade in January up to eighteen in July, and you can actually see palm trees growing there. Obviously, though the temperatures will be lower inland and on higher ground, you can expect it to rain a lot too, particularly in the west, where annually as much as two thousand millimeters regularly falls. Though this helps account for the rich variety of vegetation and wildlife. 
When you get there, you'll find there are plenty of reasonably priced places to stay. In Fort William, for instance, you can find a room for the night in a small hotel or a bed and breakfast for just £25, or for £28 to £30 in Inverness. It's probably a good idea to book ahead, though, especially in the summer months. With all the leisure, sports and cultural activities on offer, the towns are becoming increasingly popular with visitors. For example, accommodation in Inverness won't be at all easy to find this year around the 23rd of July, as that's when the local Highland Games will take place. So, if your aim is to see the countryside, it may be best to stay in a small village. Now you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. As I mentioned, there's a huge range of wildlife in the Highlands, but for those visiting the area, there are some basic ground rules that are essential if we are to protect it. Firstly, you should make every effort not to disturb birds and animals, and one way of doing this is to blend in with your surroundings, for instance by avoiding brightly coloured garments, such as orange anoraks. To see wildlife clearly, it's best to use binoculars, keeping your distance. This is particularly important during the breeding season. Wherever possible, use a hide so that they are less likely to detect your presence. Surprising though it may seem, visitors are advised to use their cars where no purpose-built hides are available, as people are apparently less likely to startle animals if they stay inside their vehicles. You may even find that creatures come up close to where you're parked, in which case, wait until they've gone before you move off. It should really go without saying that it's essential to be as quiet as possible, though sadly some people need reminding of this. Oh, and one other thing. Wild animals and pets don't mix, so please leave your dog at home or at least somewhere he or she can't chase the wildlife or damage their habitat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Caesar and a welfare officer. As you listen, answer questions 11 to 20. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good afternoon. My name is Cesar Bautisto. Hello, I'm Wendy, one of the welfare officers. Can I help you? Yes, I have to move out of my accommodation in two weeks and I can't find anywhere else to live. OK, I'll need to know some details about your current situation. I'm an overseas student 
from the Philippines. The college gave me a temporary room for one month. I can't find anywhere else, and I have no money. Have you told the college about your position, or asked them to let you stay longer in your accommodation? No, not yet. I, I didn't think that would be possible. Well, we can contact the accommodation service on your behalf to see if they'll let you stay a little longer, until you can find an alternative. Thank you. But I'm not sure that I can find another place, as they all ask for money before moving in, and I don't have any. Yes, it is usual in this country for landlords to ask for up to a month's rent in advance. Don't you have any money at all? Hardly any. I'm waiting for my grant check to be sent from the Philippines at the moment. It should have been here for me to collect when I arrived in Britain, but it seems to have been lost. You can apply for emergency loan from the union if you want. The loan can be for up to two hundred pounds, and we ask for a postdated check for the same amount to be given to us, so that we can recover the money once you receive your grant check. That would be very good. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. I'll apply, but I'm still worried about how to find new accommodation. As I said earlier, we can ask the college to extend the time you're allowed to stay in your present accommodation. They may refuse, of course. Then what will happen? If the worst comes to the worst, the union may be able to provide some very short-term emergency accommodation. If you want me to, I'll contact one or two of the addresses on the notice board, and arrange for you to visit them. But what if they ask me for the rent in advance? I only have ninety pounds left, and I need that for food and books. It'll be all right. By the time they actually need the money, we'll have your emergency loan ready. Just fill in this application form, and write me a check for two hundred pounds, please, payable to the student union. Right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for your help. I'm feeling more optimistic now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. 
They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers, fishing crews, and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. One hundred years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian. Some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29% and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns and housing provided by... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.